God, we thank you for the fathers, for the grandfathers, and for all the father figures, for the protectors and providers, for the heroes and leaders, for our mentors and friends. Today we ask you to bless them, to give them wisdom and patience, courage and kindness. We pray for all the sons and daughters to honor their fathers, to remember their wisdom, and to cherish their love. We pray for the fatherless and for those who have brokenness with their father. Show them a father's love through your love. Today, would you care for those who care for us and empower them for their holy purpose? Spirit. Our I don't think you the tone can still be Good morning, everybody. How you doing? Good. I am sick today, so if my voice sounds a little weird, that is why. Ethan and Patience, you're the only ones in the splash zone, so watch out. You're far enough away. That's more than six feet. I think you're probably good. I'm going to sound a little weird this morning, but I do have a very important message to share with you, and I'm excited to do it. I've spent a lot of time on it this week, and all the pastors have spoken into it, and it's really been great. Great time of study and learning for me, and now I get to share that with you, which is awesome. Before I get into that, I just want to share a couple of things. One is that uh, we're going to be launching Rooted again this fall, and Rooted is a 10-week discipleship experience. It is fantastic. If you have not yet gone through, I highly encourage you to do so. You can sign up for that now by going to efreeorg slash connect clicking on find a group and then clicking rooted and just let us know that you're interested in that. We're going to assemble those groups together and give you an opportunity to go through that. It's a great program. The second thing that I'll share is we have a team in Athens right now, a missions team, so be praying for them. And we have another trip coming up to Peru this fall in November. I'm going to be leading that trip. It's not going to be a normal missions trip where you're going to get to serve in a lot of different ways. This is mostly a talk with people, visit with people, pray for people kind of trip. But this is the church that we helped to sponsor, that we provided the money for so they could build their church. So this is to go see the place, uh, visit with the sponsored children. Many of us have sponsored children there. So if you want to sign up for that, go to our website and let us know that you would like to be a part of that as well. All right, I need to take a drink here. If you've got your Bibles, open up to Matthew and just be ready. Matthew 19 is where we're going to start. And then we're going to jump back to Matthew chapter 6. I want to tell you about a good Jewish boy. He knew he was going to be successful one day. He was just sharp in everything he did. He studied the Torah well. He followed every command as best as he could. Maybe he slipped up here and there, but he worked hard to recover and follow all of God's laws as much as he humanly could. And still, even with all of that, he just felt like he's not sure if he really knew God or if God was really pleased with him. Maybe all of that rule following and learning the Torah and doing everything that he was told to do, maybe that wasn't enough to give him eternal life with God, but that's what he wanted. He grew up, he worked hard, he got an apprenticeship, ended up having his own business. It was very successful. Business was good. As wealth grew and grew, he had a big house, lots of animals, fine clothes, imported furniture, many servants. God must be pleased with him because of how he conducts his life and how he conducts his business. Just look at how blessed he is. Still, there's that nagging feeling like maybe it's not enough. How can he be sure that God approves of him? How can he be sure that he's going to be a part of God's kingdom and live forever with him and not be excluded from that? Well, there's this traveling teacher coming through. People say he speaks for God like a prophet. Maybe he can go ask him and maybe he'll have the answers for what it takes to finally be certain 
that he is right with God. So he approaches Jesus, he waits his turn, and finally he speaks up in Matthew 19, 16. Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? Why ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, there is only one who is good. But to answer your question, if you want to receive eternal life, keep the commandment. Which ones? The man asked. Kind of a cheeky question, if you ask me. Which, which of God's commands should you follow? Which ones do you need to just ignore? Jesus replied, well, you must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. Honor your father and mother. Love your neighbor as yourself. I've obeyed all these commandments, the young man replied. What else must I do? Jesus told him, if you want to be perfect, go and sell your possessions. And give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. But when the young man heard this, he went away sad, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth, it is very hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. I'll say it again, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were astounded. Well, then who can be saved? They asked. Jesus looked at them intently and said, humanly speaking, it is impossible, but with God, everything is possible. Then Peter said to him, we've given up everything to follow you. What will we get? Nice, Peter. Jesus replied, I assure you that when the world is made new and the Son of Man sits upon his glorious throne, you who have been my followers will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has given up houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or property for my sake will receive a hundred times as much in return and will inherit eternal life. Many who are the greatest now will be the least important then, and those who seem least important now will be the greatest then. This young man started by asking the wrong question. He should have asked, how can I be saved from my sin so that I can be acceptable to God and live with him eternally? Instead, he asked, what can I do to earn acceptance with God, earn eternal life with God? He's used to a transactional life. Want something, you pay for it. You, you work hard, you save up money, you buy whatever you want. And God must work that way too, right? Only his currency is good work. So what's the formula? Just tell me the formula. I'm a disciplined person. I can do it. Trust me, just give me the formula. What are the good works that I need to do that's going to get me over that hurdle so that I can be right with God, have eternity with God. Is it weekly attendance at the synagogue, plus giving 25% of my income, plus helping out the poor once a month? Like, what is it? Just give me the formula. That's what I want. And he doesn't get it. He hasn't really been listening to Jesus because it's not about the deeds. It's about the faith. But Jesus plays along. If you really want eternal life on your own merit, you would have to have zero sin for your entire life perfectly live all the time. Keep God's commandments. Never sin even once. And his reply should have been, but that's impossible. Like, how could I possibly do that? And that would have been the right answer. And then Jesus would have almost certainly said, you're right. Humanly speaking, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. But that's not what the man said. Instead, he said, yeah, I've done that. I've, I've kept all the commands perfectly since I was a boy. I'm good. What else? What else do I need to do? And <laughs> Jesus is like, really? We're going to play that game? Okay, fine. Try this smart guy. Go sell everything you have. Give all your money to the poor. Then come be my disciple. You'll store up treasure in heaven. You'll have eternal life. See, the heart of the matter is the heart. What do you trust in? This man trusts in his money. So Jesus tells him he needs to take away the thing that he trusts in. You need to take away that money that is actually an idol for you, that's keeping you from trusting in God. And it reveals where this man's heart really is. He goes away sad because as much as he likes the idea of eternal life with God, he really likes his money and possessions more. And Jesus has cut right to the heart of where this man is and shown his heart to be all about his money and his possessions. And Jesus then tells the disciples, it's hard for rich people to get into God's kingdom. They trust in their riches more than they trust in God. And then the disciples ask, well, hey, if the rich can't get in, then who can't?
they can get whatever they want, right? And Jesus says, well, humanly speaking, it is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Now, this has Peter's head spinning. He's going, hold on. If we give up earthly wealth and earthly things, we get heavenly wealth. Is that what you're saying? We've given up everything to follow you. What do we get? And Jesus says in verse 28, I assure you that when the world is made new and the Son of Man sits upon his glorious throne, you who have been my followers will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone, this is important, everyone who has given up houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or property for my sake, property, even property for my sake, will receive a hundred times as much in return and will inherit eternal life. Now, here's the takeaway that I want you to remember from today. There is a formula here that's not a formula for how to get eternal life. It's a formula for rewards in eternal life. Basically, the formula is this, personal sacrifice with a Jesus purpose equals heavenly treasure. Jesus is a hundred times heavenly treasure. Now, I'll be honest, I don't think about this a lot in my day-to-day life, but the Bible talks about this a surprising amount. In fact, it honestly shocks me how much God seems to care about how we use our earthly resources. He cares about it a lot more than we might think. In the Bible, there are about 31,102 verses, depending on which version you use. And how many of those verses do you think are about prayer? About 500. How many of those verses would you say are about faith? It's a little less than 500. But how many verses are about how we use our money and possessions? 2,350. That's a lot. That's a lot of talk about money and possessions and instructions about those. You know, 42% of Jesus' parables are about money and possessions. How you use your money and possessions matters to God. It matters a surprising amount. Jesus said in Luke 16, if you are faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. But if you are dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. And if you are untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? I think we sometimes fall into this trap of thinking that there's the spiritual world and there's the material world, the non-spiritual world, and they don't mix. Like there's the spiritual side of life and the material side of life. So I go to church on Sunday and maybe I serve somewhere and I put a little money in the offering and then I have the rest of my life and my job and my hobbies and, and entertainment, sports, and all that's all a separate thing. But the Bible tells us that God cares about all of it and he even cares how you use your money. More than that, He views your handling of earthly money, U.S. dollars in our case, as a test for how you can handle heavenly wealth. How crazy is that? Look back at verse 10 of Luke 16. If you're faithful in little things, you'll be faithful in large ones. If you're dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with the greater ones. If you're untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? That's a crazy statement. God views how you handle earthly resources as a test of your ability to handle heavenly riches. Heavenly riches matter infinitely more than earthly riches, but your earthly wealth and your heavenly wealth are connected in God's eyes. As Jesus was talking with that rich young man about storing up treasure in heaven, I have to imagine the disciples, that phrase triggered for them their onboarding plats when Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7, delivers this discipleship training to his early disciples, this first training with them. And he says in Matthew 6, 19, don't store up treasures here on earth. Moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Let me pause for a minute and be clear about something. When he says, don't store up treasure on earth, he's not saying don't save money. He's not saying you shouldn't have anything in reserve. He's talking about trusting in your wealth, treasuring your wealth on earth, hoarding it. There's this time where Jesus tells a story about a rich man who had a very profitable farm and the farm was so productive that he decided to tear down his old barns and build big new ones. And he trusted in his wealth and his his resources, but he had no relationship with God. And he dies and God says, you fool, you spent all your time trying to get more riches and now you'll lose them. And Jesus tells his followers, it's a foolish person who builds personal treasure, but is not rich toward God. The issue is not about whether you save or don't save. The issue is, are you trusting in money instead of God? 
The Bible actually tells us to be wise savers in many different places. Here's a few of them. Proverbs 6, 6 says, Take a lesson from the ants, you lazy bones. Love that. Learn from their ways and become wise. Though they have no prince or governor or ruler to make them work, they labor hard all summer doing what? Gathering food for the winter. They save up so they have enough for later. Proverbs 13 says, Wealth from get-rich-quick schemes quickly disappears. Wealth from hard work grows over time. So work hard and your wealth should grow over time. It should accumulate more. Proverbs 21, the wise have wealth and luxury, but fools spend whatever they get. They don't save anything. They don't manage their money well. Paul even told the Corinthian church when he was encouraging them to be generous givers, he says, of course, I don't mean your giving should make life easy for others and hard for yourselves. I only mean there should be some equality. I remember back in the early 2000s, there was this resurgence of something called new monasticism, and it was big among a lot of college students, and I was a college student at the time. Like many movements, there was some good and there was some bad to it, but one of the interesting things, I had friends that dabbled in this a little bit, is that some of these people glorified a life of poverty. The idea that you were going to just give up almost all material possessions, many of them decided we're going to live communally so that we can make this happen, and, and they practically took a vow of poverty, basically, as if being poor was somehow godlier and would get you closer to God. Now, I understand a little bit of where they're coming from. The idea is the same as the rich young man. Get rid of all the worldly temptations, and then all we're going to do is focus on God. But God never tells believers to take a vow of poverty or that it's wrong to save or even that it's wrong to live comfortably. He just doesn't want us hoarding wealth and trusting it. That's the issue. Now, if you're so focused on wealth that it's an idol to you, then maybe it would be good to scale back a bit or a lot. So that your focus is entirely on God. But it's not that we're supposed to be poor. It's not that we're supposed to live as monks without any material resources, but we can't make money our idol. Don't treasure your earthly wealth. Here's what we're supposed to do instead. Verse 20, store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. The heart of the matter is heart not about how much you treasure. It's about what you treasure. Are the desires of your heart toward your wealth or toward your God? Are you more focused on your job and your resources and material things on this earth, the next purchase you want to make, or on getting to know God better and following him, obeying him, learning more about him? The treasures of earth will all degrade. They will disappear, Jesus says. Sometimes they can disappear overnight. People have lost most of their net wealth in a matter of a day. And if that's what you're trusting in, then you need to rethink those priorities. Earthly wealth is an idol to so many people. Jesus tells us that the heavenly riches are so much more valuable than that. He says, moths and rust won't destroy them. Thieves won't steal them. So unlike earthly investments, heavenly investments are guaranteed. It's not a risky venture to invest in heavenly investments. But I, I do want to be transparent about this. Heavenly treasure does have two distinct disadvantages. The first one is that it's hard to see. You can't just pull up your heaven app and go, how's my investment doing? Like, oh, we're up 8% today. That's good. It's, it's something you just have to trust to God. That's a part of the whole deal. It's like, I have faith. I trust in God. And if your trust in God is small, you'll probably make few heavenly investments. If your trust in God is big, then you may make more heavenly investments investments. But that leads me to the second disadvantage of heavenly investments, which is that it's not always clear how to make a deposit. What do we mean by heavenly investment? What does Jesus mean by storing up treasure in heaven? What's he talking about? Throughout history, kings and rulers have tried to figure out some way they could take their money with them. How can I make sure that I am set up in the afterlife with a lot of good stuff that I accumulated in this life. And that's why they built big tombs and had burial rituals and put all kinds of gold and treasures and jewelry with them. And of course, that led to tons of grave robbing. And so now all that wealth is either stolen or in museums around the world. They couldn't take it with them. The way to store up your treasure in heaven is to follow the pattern that Jesus gave the disciples after talking with the rich man. What did he say? Personal sacrifice because of Jesus, with a Jesus purpose, because of him equals heavenly treasure. Or as Jesus said, 100x heavenly treasure. And the word I really want you to focus on there is the word sacrifice. That's an important word. Jesus did not say, 
if you have some left over after you've bought everything you want, maybe kick a little bit of that my way. He didn't say that. He said, if you've given up, you've given up relationships, you've given up houses, you've given up property for my sake. You've given up relationships with family members because they have abandoned you because you followed me. You're going to get a hundred times better in heaven. It's about the sacrifice. He pointed this out in real time in Luke 21. While Jesus was in the temple, he watched the rich people dropping their gifts in the collection box. Then a poor widow came by and dropped in two small. I tell you the truth, Jesus said, this poor widow has given more than all the rest of them. For they have given a tiny part of their surplus, but she, poor as she is, has given everything she has. And this is a window into how God views your sacrificial giving. When people who have less choose to live on less so they can give to God, that's a high value gift to God. And when people who have more choose to throw a little bit God's way, almost as a, a token gift, check the box, whatever it is, but they give a smaller proportion of their wealth, that's a less valuable gift to God, spiritually speaking. Why? Because it's not about the money. God doesn't need your money. It's about the face. How you give money reveals your faith. The poor widow gave because she trusted that God would take care of her. And so she gave everything she had going, you know what? God's going to look out for me. He's going to take care of me. The wealthy people give less because they have such a value, such a trust in their accumulation of wealth. It all connects with faith. Studies that have been done in the last 20 years on giving in this country show that people who make less money on average give a higher per percentage of their income than people who make more money. Isn't that a weird thing? You would think that as you gain more and more money, you would realize, hey, I can even give a bigger portion now because I don't need all of this to live on. I've lived just fine this way. Now I'm going to give even more and bless more people and be even more generous. But that's not how it works, is it? Because you make a little bit more money and then you get a little nicer house. Now the houses around you are a little nicer and those people have nice cars. I probably need a new car too. And you just keep moving on up that ladder with like, oh, that toy looks fun and that thing looks good. And there's nothing wrong with having good things, nice things, enjoying this creation that God has given, enjoying the blessings that God has given. But sometimes what ends up happening is we slip into this valuing the things of this world more than the things of God. And, and so as we get wealthier, we actually give less proportionally to God. We may think our giving has stayed the same. We may even think our giving has gone up a little bit. And yet from God's perspective, it's gone down because we're not trusting him with as much portion as we once were. It's a, it's a sacrifice. It's about faith and it's about the sacrifice. I know people who give generously to the church and they choose not to have certain luxuries they could otherwise have because of it. Just last week, Jenny and I were talking about a trip that we want to take and some of the things we want to do. And we were just remarking on how much more expensive things have gotten. And what, deciding what we were going to do based on, well, what is the cost? And this is, might be too much. And it, it, the thought struck me of like, wow, this would be less of a question except for the giving. Like if you give enough that it impacts what you can do on vacation, then that's more of a sacrifice. That's a heavenly investment. And many people do. Many people give and choose to live on less because they're giving something up. They're sacrificing because they're showing their faith in the kingdom. A lot of people give $10, $20 a month and think, oh, I'm doing something good. But what they don't realize is God doesn't need your money. He wants your faith. He wants you to trust him so much that you say, your kingdom and your work in this world matters more to me than earthly resources. God's kingdom matters more than a new car. It matters more than a bigger house. It matters more than a nice vacation. It matters more than another fun toy because it's not about the money. It's about the faith. And faith is only demonstrated if the giving is done with a sacrifice, if something's been given up. And even in sharing that with us, Jesus says, you do realize you'll get 100x on your investment. If I knew of an investment today that would guarantee 100x, I would be all over it. And you would too, right? If you knew this is a sure thing, hundred times your investment. Yeah, and all over that. Now, should that be our primary motivation? Well, maybe not. But I was thinking about this yesterday and realized 
even if part of our motivation is, I want those heavenly rewards, man. I want that 100x return rate in heaven. Even if that's part of it, that is also a demonstration of faith. And that's why I think Jesus doesn't mind sharing with us that, hey, this is what's happened on the back end, guys. I've got you covered. Because it's faith that Jesus is going to deliver. It's faith in the promises of God. Faith that he says, you know what? Your earthly resources, doesn't, it doesn't matter that much. But I know it matters a lot to you. And understandably so. So I want you to invest that into my work to show your faith in me. And then I promise you good things are going to happen on the back end of that. And even trusting in that and trusting in those heavenly rewards is an act of faith. God, Paul actually says this to Timothy. In 1 Timothy 6, he says, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money. He doesn't say they all need to give it all away. Just don't trust in your money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God, who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always ready to share with others. By doing this, they will be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience true life. I think he's talking about the same thing Jesus was talking about, storing up treasure in heaven. In a nutshell, don't trust money. Trust God. Be generous with money and do good. Store up treasure in heaven. And what's really interesting to me is that the rewards promise to the generous givers are not just in heaven. Look at Proverbs 3, 9. It says, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything you produce. Then he will fill your barns with grain and your vats will overflow with good wine. There's actually material benefit promised on earth to those who honor the Lord with the best part of what they produce. That's the sacrificial part. You know, this is an agrarian society that Proverbs is written to. People a lot of times are giving grain, they're giving animals. And so they're taking the best part that they would maybe like to consume and saying, I'm going to give that to God. That's a sacrifice. I'm going to give up best. And yet, what's the principle? He's going to fill your barns with the grain. He's going to make your vats overflow with good wine. He's going to bless you with resources. Proverbs 11, 24 says, give freely and become more wealthy. Be stingy and lose everything. The generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. Malachi 3 says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open up the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. There are not many places where God says, go ahead, try me. Test. And yet he says it about giving. I have yet to hear of a single person who could say, I went broke because I gave too much to God's kingdom. Or someone who says, I was really hurt financially because I gave sacrificially and boy, that messed me up. Never heard that. Never, ever. I've heard the reverse many times. Wow. When I really started to be serious about giving, God just blessed in ways I never even anticipated. Now, those verses that I just looked at, those are in the Old Testament. So is that just Old Testament or is this New Testament as well? Second Corinthians 9, Paul is talking with the church in Corinth. He's taking up an offering to give to the church in Jerusalem. And here's what he says. I thought I should send these brothers ahead of me to make sure the gift you promised is ready. But I want it to be a willing gift, not one given grudgingly. Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. Hold on a minute, Paul. This is sounding a lot like prosperity go here. We got to be careful. Are you sure what you're talking about? What do you mean by that? Verse seven. You must each decide in your heart how much to give and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure for God loves a person who gives cheerfully and God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. So if I'm generous, God is going to bless me with more so I can be more generous. Is that what he's saying? As the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever for God is the one who provides the seed for the farmer and then bread to eat in the same way he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. He will provide an increase in your resources. It can't get much clearer than that. Look at the purpose. Look at the reason. This is why this is so important and so distinct. It's not so you can get a bigger house, a nicer car, take a nicer vacation, have more toys to play, fancier clothes. No, I is it. So you can be more generous. That's what's different about what the Bible says from prosperity preaching. When you give sacrificially with the right motives, God promises heavenly rewards, 
He promises to take care of your needs on this earth. He promises to bless you so that you can be even more generous. The prosperity teachers say you give and you plant your seed so that you can get a whole bunch of stuff that you want to have. Live the life that you want to have. And money continues to be the idol in that case. But what Paul teaches is that generous people who give sacrificially to God's work will be blessed with more so they can be even more generous. And he doubles down on this. Look at verse 11. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. He's talking about earthly wealth here. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. So two good things will result from this ministry of giving. The needs of the believers in Jerusalem will be met and they will joyfully express their thanks to God. As a result of your ministry, they will give glory to God for your generosity to them and to all believers will capture this in your minds right now. Prove that you are obedient to the good news of Christ. And they will pray for you with deep affection because of the overflowing grace, overflowing grace God has given you. Thank God for this gift. Two wonderful for words. I want to point out two things about this passage. First is that your generous giving is a part of obedience to the gospel. The good news from Jesus is that he died for your sins so that by believing in him and his sacrifice, you can be made right with God, have an eternal home in heaven. And so this earth is not your own. This is not a place that you have to worry about for eternity. This isn't all there is. There's more after this. And by giving up earthly resources, it's actually a part of that is showing that you trust the gospel message is true. You trust this isn't all there is, that there's something better to come, that there's a better future that God has for his children, and that there's a bunch of stuff we'll get to do that I don't even know what it all is. But Jesus says, you got a hundred times rewards waiting in you there for anything you give up here. I should probably be giving up a little more if I believe that. If I trusted that. And so Paul says this proves your obedience in the good news. It actually is a gospel activity to be giving sacrificially. The second thing I want you to notice about this passage is that the ability to be a part of God's work and caring for the church is a gift to wonderful for words. God doesn't need your He allows you to be a part of his work. He even structures it as an investment opportunity for you. What a gift. Paul says, this is a wonderful gift, too wonderful for words. Like God says, here, little human, that I care about so much, I don't actually need anything you have to offer. I can do this all on my own. I want you to be a part of it. In fact, I'm going to make this a really sweet deal for you. I'm going to, as a part of your faith and obedience, as you give sacrificially of your worldly wealth, I'm going to return on that investment. It's going to be great for you. As you make personal sacrifices for my sake, you're going to get 100x and heavenly rewards, and I'll bless you with even more resources so you can be even more generous. It's, it's going to be like a generosity snowball that gets bigger and bigger. The way Paul puts it is an overflowing of the grace of God. It's an overflowing. And he ties that all back to earthly resources. Now, next week, I want to look at how God wants us to use our money I want to answer some key questions about giving and about money that people often have. In fact, if you have a question you want to throw in there, just email me at pastor at efree.org. And I'd love to cover that if I can next week. I want to talk about how giving gets used here. Where does the money go? What does it get used for? How does it align with biblical principles? I want to do all that. But my challenge for you today is just to do a self-evaluation. Given what we've talked about this morning, maybe you learned some new things about giving that you haven't heard before or haven't heard in a long time. Could you honestly describe your giving to God's work as sacrificial? Or is it more token? Is it something where God would say, wow, you're giving so that you can invest in my kingdom. That's an act of faith in me. Did God say that about the way you give to his work. Are you giving up much for the sake of Jesus? Do you give out of obedience to the gospel and faith in God? And I would encourage you to pray today. Spend some time in prayer asking God, if he wants you to step out in faith and be more generous, more sacrificially generous to his work, and then watch and see if he doesn't bless you. I think he will. I've, I've never heard of, of people who did not say after a year, wow, I stepped up my giving and man, God just blessed. I'm not trying to give some prosperity promise. The whole point of it is not so you can live a, a glorious, luxurious life. The whole point is so that you can start this generosity snowball. 
and be even more generous to other people. It's going to unlock something in you that Jesus and God want for you as you grow in your, in your faith and in your sacrificial gift. It's what God wants for you. Let's pray right now if you'd bow your heads with me. Father, you teach us so much in your word. And one of the things that is in there a lot, but we don't actually talk about a lot, is our money and how we use it. And how you have designed for us to use that, some of that for you. You've, you've given it all to us. You've made us stewards of whatever we have. And sometimes we cling to it so tightly, God. So I pray that you would help us to be generous and sacrificial in our giving. I pray that you'd help us to notice when others are in need and care for them in generous ways. I pray that you would help us to see opportunities to help people with more than just financial resources. So pray that you would give us a heart to really want to, to give and support the ministry that you're doing through your church, God. And I pray that you would just bless rich as we choose to do that. May it, may it work in our heart and grow a harvest of generosity that's bigger than we've ever experienced before. May you bless us with extra ways to be generous and help people and that we would see fruit from it, not just monetarily, but fruit from it in our spiritual growth. Fruit from it as we give generously to be more all in for your kingdom, more all in for your church, God. That you would use that to bless us and our families and the people around us and even bring people to you in ways we never saw coming. So Lord, convict us, guide us into the life you want us to live. We pray this in your name. Amen.